Well, it is my pleasure to turn the time over to Mark at Invisible People. How many of you watch Mark, have subscribed to his YouTube channel? Like really the, the best in this work. And I will also say, one of the most honest, authentic people who will tell the story without reservation. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mark. I just wanna give him the biggest thank you um, I saw him do a presentation very similar to this at another conference and asked if he would come and do this. And we exchanged phone numbers. And I'm just going to say in Mark's number, uh, not I'm going to give your number out, but there are a lot of threes in his number. Jack, you have his number. There are a lot of threes in his number. And I got a three in the wrong place, and I'm leaving messages and texting somebody, and Mark's sending me messages and saying, hey, you said you'd call me, <laughs> you would text me. So it is literally a miracle and a gift that Mark uh, forgave my inability to put a number in my phone uh, to be here today. And I hope that you guys are all not only inspired, but fired up after hearing from Mark. I'm gonna turn it over to him. Hey, everybody. How's the pretzels? So, just leave the presentation up. Don't go back and forth to the camera. You got a full day of disclaimers. So this is the disclaimer that has been on the Invisible People website since 2008. And I'm gonna go through this really quick. It's much more involved conversation. Happy to talk to anybody after. Um, and hopefully, you'll grab something from this. The title of the presentation was, you know, why are we losing the war on narrative? And the reason for that is homelessness is growing and people are getting frustrated. This is a town hall and the politician just said, we're going to provide housing for homeless people. They spoke with a Marine Corps veteran and business owner who helps homeless veterans. She hit the streets to talk to as many homeless residents as possible, including one woman who says San Diego makes living on the streets not that hard. Watch. To be homeless in San Diego is actually not that hard because usually we're low income and when you're low income you get free phones, free food, free clothing. I think we're spoiling the homeless and, and the underprivileged. I think we're spoiling to be honest with you. My sister's like, where do I sign up? You gotta see that they're positioning as experts, you have a military veteran, who we all respect, is out here sharing these stories, and the homeless person, the narrative of the homeless person, is also the expert. Homelessness isn't about lack of affordable housing. It's about drug addicts that want to wander around and live in tents on the sidewalk. And so you can't coddle antisocial behavior. The narrative, the false narrative of homelessness, especially addiction, that's pushing for forced encampments, is spread. I'm just going to show a little sample of that. This is Kevin, who's in Portland. He was recently arrested. Um, he was taking homeless people's identities and using them to... Uh, uh, rip the government off and he is silent for right now but he'll come back there's hundreds of cabinets and they're being incentivized they're being paid to share the propaganda the negative propaganda on social media much of it is you know, a homeless woman here saying, homelessness is liberating. I want to be homeless. We, there's also lots of content 
of why Housing First is flawed. They're doing first person interviews that I actually pioneered in 2008, and they're using it to reinforce false narratives. And the news media eats it up. The news media is always looking for controversy. So they're amplifying the false narratives. Went downtown to talk to some drug addicts to figure out how this all happened. So what's going on here? Is this MO use? Well, I'm going to go talk with them really quick. It's looks like so much tripping potentially. Hey, I'm with my friends. I was wondering if you would want to talk to them for a second for $5. Is this something you would want to do there? So they claim Kevin is a social worker, but I don't know any social worker that would go and try to exploit a homeless person like that. This is Tyler. Tyler makes hundreds of thousands of dollars producing these videos, pushing the false narrative, often to young adults. This is his Skid Row video. That's his Phoenix video. They have millions and millions and millions and millions of views influencing the public of, on reinforcing the harmful narratives. But it's not alone, it's a growing genre. And because people are making money, it's spreading. Type in Kensington into YouTube. And the growing genre is they just have a camera and they're holding it out the window and they're just filming people in addiction and mental health and they're making millions of dollars so more people go out and grab cameras and film them and it is growing and it is a narrative crisis. Then you have in each little community, I was just in Manchester, New Hampshire, a town of about 40,000 people, and they have social media hate accounts. So this is Denver, this is Austin, and Los Angeles, and Long Beach, but in every city there's social media hate accounts. <laughs> And it is considered citizens' journalism. Here's Elon, please encourage more citizens' journalism. You can do live video easily from your phone. Michael Schellenberger paid Soledad $25,000 to spread propaganda on social media. Michael Schellenberger spread, paid this organization $50,000 to put fentanyl billboards up in San Francisco. And if you look at the opposition, the people pushing for criminalization, the people that are pushing for force camp, that are fighting housing first, they're all working together. They are all working together and they're all sharing the same message. I have a friend in HUD that said senators and politicians are sharing the same messaging that they're seeing on social media and news. This is Robert Marbit's movie that's coming out. Robert Marbit is the executive producer. It has an $8 million budget. Do you think this movie is going to be promoting housing? as a solution. It has already won 234 awards. It's already got news media and buzz. It has a curriculum. It has uh, music and art to go along with it. And they are paying 50% of the profits plus an additional million dollars for you all to promote it. If you're a nonprofit and you promote Marbit's film, you're going to make money. It's brilliant marketing. And it is to spread false information on homelessness. Prager University has a $65 million a year budget. You'll notice that here, their fundraising metrics, they're using views, right? For $500, you can help fund 25,000 views. The homeless sector does not even value marketing metrics, right? And the opposition that's spreading all this, you know, just, ah, is, you know, well-funded 
well organized and they understand media publishing. You know, you have Nikki Haley, be brave. Did capitalism save the communist China? What is critical race theory? You can go on and on. Why girls become boys? Do you think these are great educational titles? They, you know, if, if you know me, I am not big on long form documentaries because homelessness is a hard topic and people are not going to sit through. It's great. Long form documentaries are great to rally us, to get us on the same message, but it, it doesn't work to, you know, just ask Al Gore in that climate change movie he did, how much a long form movie is changing. But now Prager is doing short form docs. Um, and their upcoming is unwoke, masculinity, and detransition. But they're targeting kids. They have a significant media publishing that has now been approved in Montana and Florida schools. That is the opposition to housing. That is what they're doing. But it even gets worse. We have the 2024 election season coming and politicians are using criminalization rhetoric to pander to voters. I fear for my home's future. The California dream has turned to a nightmare. The politicians have let us down. A few months ago, Trump says he'll ban homeless camping and create 10 cities. So this is already happening. Pallet shelters, their business, which it's, it's basically a shack meant for a lawnmower, right? Jail cells by law have to be bigger and jail cells have bathroom and a sink. Pallet Shelter's business has, has increased 7,000%. We're already moving extremely fast to forced internment camps. The growing movement, the narrative that people are pushing for is to take homeless people, put them on a bus up to Lancaster and put them in a camp. And they do it with a, with a kind of a compassionate spin. Here, Newsom, uh, you know, is investing 300 million more, he announced last week, for more um, homeless sweeps. One thing we do in the homeless industry is we still rely a lot on legacy media. But one third of all newspapers and digital will be gone by next year. Why? The traffic is not there. People are not going, consuming news like they once did. We all think it is. We gotta get the op-ed in the New York Times, but they're not. And news media will always go for the negative story. Always they'll go for the negative story. This post in the New York Times, this story in the New York Times, was a great story about Houston, but it didn't influence any change. Mostly it was all us reading it. All of us sharing it, right? And, you know, I, behind the scenes, I have friends at the LA Times that say the traffic, the homeless uh, stories that we produce are some of the lowest traffic because it's a niche audience. It's just us, mostly just us. Now, there is a place for news media. I'm not saying they're not. In fact, we are a news publisher. We'll get to that in a second. The world has changed. How many of you know of Mr. Beast? It's so strange. Last night I asked the table, we're out to eat, and people didn't know who Mr. Beast is. Mr. Beast is probably the biggest internet celebrity right now. His videos are breaking records that on the first day they're hitting 50 million views. In the first day. So legacy media is dying. Nobody's reading the newspaper, whether it's online, yet there's still attention, right? There's still media that people are consuming. You all know the song Old Town Road, right? Do you know how he made it? Do you know how he got famous? He bought the track for $200 and then he created internet memes. 
and then he pushed the memes out on TikTok and Instagram till we all got used to the song. So then when he published the song, we all knew it, and it got huge. Why are we not creating memes about how housing works? We're still focused on legacy media that is dying instead of seeing, gosh, the world is consuming Mr. You know, Mr. Beast videos. Mr. Beast is doing a bunch of philanthropy. Who's reaching out to Mr. Beast to get him to do something about housing? There's four, I wish we had time to go into it, there's four real, uh, there's four audiences. There's politicians, there's nonprofits, there's the general public, and there's news media. So, for example, National Alliance to End Homelessness, their audience is all of you and somewhat politicians, right? And invisible people, we focus on the general public. So I'm gonna use me as a case study about reaching the general public only because I don't know anybody else that's having, you know, 20, 000, 20 million views a month. So we publish daily news, uh, six original posts every week uh, on Apple News, Google News, and the strategy behind it is you can't control a reporter, right? But I can control the media. And, and there's a different strategy behind this too. And here we are, right next to the LA Times, right next to CNN, right next to Newsweek, right next to BBC. We are right there. And every Saturday, we post a story from someone with lived experience. Several of them are actually homeless. But, remember the, the Mr. Beast and everything? We are transitioning our news content to video content. This week in Invisible People's Homelessness News, here are three stories that you need to know. In a tragic event, a 73-year-old homeless woman named Abedesh Waldesiatis died in an Arlington County Detention Center. Why was she arrested? We are trying to do more. Despite being high to the education about this information. We produce scripted films. We do mini documentaries. We do animations. Here's just a, a short little clip of three of the styles of videos we do. I don't know what I would do if my ID got towed. Without it, I think, I genuinely don't even want to think about what I would do. Because it, I just, I don't know. <laughs> Be out on the streets in the tent. Again, yeah. Just restarting again. And then Kevin Hart and Strong taking everything. We don't want to be out here, you know. We're trying to do the best we can. It's pretty difficult when they don't give us very much notice. It's pretty devastating because people are losing everything that they own when they don't own much to begin with, so. 30 to 50 percent of people who are unsheltered in Seattle live in vehicles. That can be anywhere between 3,000 to potentially up to 5,000 people. It's hard to say because, like most point in time counts, they're a bare minimum estimate. Uh, many cities like Seattle have regulations that push vehicles that are oversized, such as RVs, into industrial zones, which are often very far from where social services are located. So there's a really systemic disconnection between many people who are living in vehicles and the actual social service systems. So outreach that can come to people who are living in vehicles is essential for keeping people connected to housing navigation, social services, and medical care. A high school student can handle a more detailed discussion about the lack of affordable housing and the challenges of finding a job if you don't have a car or have kids at home to take care of. And don't shy away from core issues like poverty and racism. Homelessness is complicated, but your team can handle it. If your child is six years old or younger, you're probably going to hear why a lot when you're explaining to a younger child. Hang in there and take it step by step. Why don't we have a bed to sleep in? When we go to the store, we have to pay for things with money. Some people don't have enough money to pay for things like a bed. Why? Well, they might be too sick to have a job and they might not have a family to help them. Why can't we help them? We can. We can give them food and water. We can say hello. They are our neighbors too, and we should be kind to our neighbors. If the whys keep coming, and you know they will, just be honest. Kids are curious, and that's a good thing. Take a moment to gently let them know that they are safe, 
even though others might be struggling. And then be as open as you feel is appropriate about what they see. The best thing is for you not to get addicted. No, I love you, right? I see here there's an active court case against you. Well, why can't we just do what the drug says and stay? Because we have to be proactive and not just wait for things to happen. Well, it looks like the judge denied your appeal because you failed to prove income. Do you know how much a substitute teacher makes? I'm doing this for my daughter. Father! Oh, shut up! I won't let you hurt my mom anymore! My mother couldn't do better. I have to do better for her. I felt like a normal person for once. It's hot. Shout out to God. I know what we're going to do, we're going to figure it out. I'm sharing this to show the value of becoming a media publisher and becoming a good storyteller. I first set up what we're up against. Now we all have to change how we tell stories. So this is our year to date reach, 212 million people. And this is engagement. Engagement is so much more because that means somebody clicked, commented, liked. And to prove again, doing something new, up until March, we had 40,000 followers, not a whole lot. And in March, I changed the strategy to more social video. And now we are going to hit half a million Facebook uh, followers in a short amount of time. But more importantly, what we are trying to do, because I can't compete with the LA Times, if you Google Cicero Institute, the first thing that comes up is an Invisible People news post. And it, that says, Cicero Institute makes homelessness worse. So I'm strategically, my hidden agenda is that if you type the word homeless or related homeless youth, homeless veteran, that we are going to be there. And we already rank higher than any other website, news media, other nonprofits on all keywords. And we also run ads for when people search for things. And again, well, here's that. And I, I will close with this. In this one tweet by a housewife in the Valley, this is how you message housing. People work hard for their homes, and they resent the idea of someone getting one for free. This is mostly because people are assholes and they can't understand mental illness, cycles of poverty, being a veteran, or just bad luck. So stop talking to folks about housing. Talk to them about how you'll make their lives better by getting homeless people away from them since that's all they really care about. So historically, what we have done in the homeless sector is we've said, my goodness, Housing, it helps John. John can brush his teeth. He can close the door. And Mary has a shower. And we all care about that. But the public doesn't. All the public wants is that homeless encampment gone. And the more that we have message just how housing helps homeless people, we've basically created our own resistance. People are having trouble paying for their own rent, and we're showing this beautiful apartment, and homeless, and the public's going, huh, what? And when are these people going to be removed? So what we do is we message that housing removes homeless camps. People don't realize you send a homeless person to jail, you're going to get out and still be homeless. The only way to get rid of the encampment is to supply housing and prevent homelessness. It is growing unsurmountably. It's, it's, it's a housing crisis. It's not a homeless crisis. It is a housing crisis. I was recently in Helsinki. We're doing a documentary showing how they ended housing first. And I'm going to play a short clip. That's the end of the mayor, former mayor of Helsinki. He was also the housing minister that brought housing first to Finland. Um, he's also the leader of like this central right party. So he's not quite Donald Trump, but he's close, right? So he's a conservative. 
And he is the one who brought housing, for, well, he's the one of many who helped bring housing first to Finland. Notice how he messages housing first. Not one time did he talk about benefits to, how, to homeless people. 100% of everything he said was benefits to the public, business, tourism. Over around the world, you see homeless people in the streets. In some cities more, in some cities less. In Finland and Helsinki you see less because of the housing first. And I'm sure that that is something which benefits the city of Hats. It has helped the community. I think that the people who are living in Helsinki think that this is a safer and pleasant city because of not having those people in the streets. And it's also a better city for visitors, for tourists, and also a better city for, for example, foreign direct investments, knowing that this is a clean, safe, pleasant, well-organized city. So, um, you are actually able to create a huge amount of different kind of benefits, both for the community and also for the local business society. So Ann Donald and Jeff said this morning, it's up to all of us to change how we message. And that's message your coworkers, people in church, people next to you in McDonald's. We have to start messaging how housing provides benefit to the public. I'm a big house, uh, a big Ford service flash person. So uh, we did a four-minute little thing on housing first, invisiblepeople.tv.